started Brainwave in 2008. So we're coming right round. <laughs> and uh, now we've we've really talked about happiness quite a lot at this museum. Um, actually, everybody who leaves this museum talks happily, I think, about it. Uh, but uh, we did actually make a special effort by inviting some singularly unhappy people to come and talk about happiness. Um, a few years ago, um, the late and wonderful Elaine Stritch, uh, Neil LeBute, Amy Mann uh, were amongst them. But as Sharon Salzberg uh, said just this afternoon when she was conducting her a weekly meditation session here on Wednesdays, which happens at one o'clock, and it's free to members, by the way, so you should always come and say. Um, she said, happiness is not a limited commodity. You don't have to sort of be happy and then sad the next day. You don't have to be. It's possible that you can be happy and happy. <laughs> so, uh, so why not have another session about happiness? Because we're exploring emotions this season and uh, how they can sometimes dictate who we are and sometimes how they can be an expression of who we are. And we're going to see where we strike that balance. So Emma Seppala has uh, produced a book as a result of her many, many years of studying empathy and happiness, and it's called The Happiness Track. And, you know, it... Sounds like it's a very um, how-to book because it says how to apply the science of happiness to accelerate your success. Now, some people don't necessarily equate success and achievement and a career with um, the sort of happiness that might emanate from uh, the environment of the Reuben. But she has discovered a few things and with the help of some rats, by the way. That's how scientists do it these days. I don't know whether you knew that. Um, and, and just sort of give you a sense of that, uh, she says uh, in a chapter uh, called Understand the Kindness Edge, many people believe self-interest is innate, but research with infants and animals proves them wrong. These studies show that compassion is actually a natural instinct. Even rats are driven to empathize with a suffering rat and go out of their way to help it out of its quandary. Now, you all remember the pizza rat. Did you know why the pizza rat was actually doing what it was doing? You see, the motive, the motive's really interesting. Um, studies conducted at the prestigious Max Planck Institute in Germany suggest that a compa uh, compassion is an inborn trait in both animals and humans. A series of fascinating experiments showed that both chimpanzees and infants uh, too young to have learned the rules of politeness, spontaneously engage in helpful behavior when confronted with another in need. So there's hope for us. <laughs> and uh, she's going to impart some of that hopeful uh, knowledge to the wonderful Parker Posey, who's here with us tonight. Parker uh, first set foot in this museum in a public way when she introduced um, one of her favorite films, in our cabaret cinema series on Friday nights, Night of the Hunter, and it was a stunning night. And um, now you remember, of course, hate and love on the knuckles of that film. Well, that could have been shown in our series too, but we've chosen a few others. Um, Parker's got a very busy year ahead of us, or rather she's done the work already, and we've got a very busy, busy year ahead of us um, to actually uh, see some of her films. She's got four films out coming this year. And um, they are, include The Brits Are Coming with Tim Roth and Uma Thurman, Christopher Guest's Mascots, and of course we all remember Waiting for Guffman and uh, Best in Show, and a second Woody Allen film. So we're really excited about um, her future. You know, of course, she embodied uh, the uh, indie pick for so long, and now she has moved on to these other territories, which is really exciting to see. And uh, she's uh, a great person. So. We're going to invite her to the stage along with Emma Seppala. Please. Thank you, Tim. Hi, Emma. We color coordinated and we didn't know, and this is very happy. <laughs> the moo moo and the hot pink dress. Can't go wrong. Can't be sad. We won't be sad now. No, we won't. Promise. Thanks for coming out in the in the sad rainy weather today. <laughs> the rain always makes me happy though, because oh. the we have the umbrellas and we have everyone kind of struggling and getting through it, and I I, I like that. 
I love the, the crappy umbrellas. The, it was like $5, and then the, the cap came <laughs> off, and, I was like, and it only went up to here. <laughs> and then you see them all by the trash cans the next day. Very true. Yeah. With I love very, New York. Very happy again. <laughs> so Parker, tell me um, one question that you know is so interesting is, and that we often ask people in, in studies is, what brings you the greatest fulfillment? What really makes you feel fulfilled? Um, I would say um, it has to do with um, a lot about with the moment and synchronicity when things are just flowing and they don't feel like I'm being put on the spot and there's not many projections happening with between people. I would say fulfillment for me is through what I do in making and uplifting, um, I guess, stories or characters or ideas. If I'm not, if I'm not having that harmony and exchange with, with others, um, I get I get depressed. That said, I think that that harmony is happening all the time. So I asked you earlier if you meditate. Now, I meditate, but I don't sit down, and I know that's not uh, what meditation <laughs> is. Um, I say that I, I do a walking meditation, which is basically just living here and uh, <laughs> trying to stay. Uh, you know, being more of a, uh, like I was saying backstage, like I feel like the city just calls us to be like a Jedi master of like whatever comes at us and to transform it into um, um, a good mood, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'd say like when I feel that everything is in its place in that way, it's a big part of why I live here, Yeah. right? Um, it's a challenge, but there's also an energy there. Mm -hmm. um, that really, that, I say that fulfill, does that make sense as a fulfillment? Yeah, and especially that when you were saying about that harmony and connection with other people. Yeah. So research shows that we always think, you know, we're going to get happy from the next fulfillment, the next accomplishment, the next achievement, or perhaps from that house we're going to buy or that perfect partner we're going to meet. Yeah. But if you look at the research, even when you get those things, there may be a little burst of happiness, but then you you go right back to where you were, and it's very short, uh, short lived. Yeah. But that the greatest levels of fulfillment that we can feel come from that connection with other people, a positive yeah. connection, and also um, especially um, nurtured by feelings like empathy, compassion, and then as you say, uplifting other people, which is so so beautiful. You mentioned that. So, but in particular, as an actress, empathy is something that you you have to feel for your character, for the characters you interact with. So, how do you? Well, it's a weird thing now because I wonder what's happening with empathy and acting, and I feel like we're in a different time and a different kind of mood in the culture. I mean, there's so much like procedural stuff, you know what I mean? And I've I've talked to actors who are like, oh God, I tried to be more human in the show and. And the director's like, you know, just be blank, you know. He just don't do it. Just like be really blank. And then he walked off, and he's like, that was really powerful. <laughs> you know? And he's like, ew. Um, you know. And we all laugh about this because we're seeing kind of something slip away. I yeah. think of a, of a style, you know, um, of, of of real characters. So when you do get to play like a real person, and the director. Uh, creates that that space for you and the other actors are like the Christopher Guest movies which I just finished it's incredibly generous and experience of like give and take and really it is about forgetting yourself to be yeah. tuned into the other person and it's surprising that funny stuff comes out that out of nowhere you know um, and you see you know when people try to be funny that it's you know, you can kind of smell it. Yeah. Um, that was gross. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I shouldn't have said that. Um, so I feel really lucky that I've been able to work in, in that way. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm just rambling now. You can interrupt me anytime you want. But you're the smart one, and you just, you're a neuroscientist, and 
Um, that doesn't make me smart. <laughs> it does, though. In my, in my book, it does. Well, it's interesting what you say because I think a lot of us feel like we have to be a certain person and um, come across a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what you're just saying is that um, that real pleasure in acting comes from authenticity. But I think that also in our everyday life, when we meet someone who's trying to put on an air of some sort, we yeah. can immediately feel it. And the reason is because our body's built for empathy. So it's the reason we cringe when we see someone tripping and falling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's the reason we um, can have tears coming when we see someone with tears in their eyes, whether it's on screen or in person. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's interesting that there's this movement towards more inauthenticity on screen, but we also can see that in, an, in our everyday life when people are trying to, I have to look this way, I have to be this way. But when we're with someone actually authentic is when we really feel like we can be ourselves. You feel happy or you, you yeah. get in a good mood, yeah. Because we yeah. register, we also register <clears throat> inauthenticity. It's so interesting because we often think I, when we, about communication as all verbal, but actually it's so much more nonverbal, which I'm sure you know oh, as I an know, actress. like my therapist, yeah. you know, like we say, um, yeah, well, when you know, you're meeting someone new, you, you're listening to what they're saying, of course, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but you are listening in a, to other things, and you see you know, their past. You see the past relationships. You see what, who their parents were like. You, know? you see the trouble with the father, with the mother. And uh, that's interesting, dating now. <laughs> Seeing what's Tell me more to, about that. To the men of, the, of, of the America. No, I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> Especially in this city, no. Yeah. Um, no, you know I'm not kidding. You know I'm serious. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so the so these rats are really smart, <laughs> and they like. But I always thought rats were real, really conniving and kind of. I mean, aren't the monkeys like what? Are, do you know a lot about monkeys? Because that makes me really happy to hear about monkeys. <laughs> well, this research showed, I mean, we often think of rats as something to just get rid of, or um, we don't think of animals always as, as superior as humans. But if you look in the animal kingdom, they, their, first, their impulse is to help. So in this particular rat study, one rat, rat was trapped. I believe it was getting electric shocks. And the other rat could help that rat. Um, but where it were to, they? Where were they? It was <laughs> <laughs> but the idea where was were they that, doing that? <laughs> what movie was this? It should be in a movie, yeah, actually. Yeah, it's a great TV show. <laughs> um, so there was that but experiment. But there's this idea that, yeah, the rat will go out of its way and go over obstacles to try and help the other. And the same thing is with, um, I think it was chimpanzees, and the same with infants. So even if you have a, a small infant that's like one or one or two years old and you drop the pen or something and you say, oh, I can't reach it, can you please help? They'll climb, and I've tried this with my own one-year-old recently. I was like, let's see if he does what they do in the study. <laughs> and he was like climbing all over his toys to try and help me reach for whatever oh, it was. Bless. But that's, and if you ask adults too, if you give adults like $100 and there's um, a few people in the study and let's say you're one of the people and I'm like, here's $100. You can do whatever you want with it. You can share it amongst everyone or you can keep it. And I give you just a couple seconds to make a decision. Chances are you're going to, your first instinct is to be fair. And I'm sure your, your yeah. second instinct is to be fair too. But for a lot of people, if you give them a little more time to think about it, and they'll be like, maybe I could use that $100. You yeah. know? So, yeah. so, but it's so interesting because what you're seeing is that the first instinct is to be fair. But we often think, Everyone's selfish, it's doggy dog. Uh -huh. um, you know, everyone's out for number one. But that's not our natural instinct, and I think Sharon Salzberg, who's here tonight, would agree with that. Do you know Sharon? She's wonderful. She's here. So we're really like, we, we take the, the $100, and we go like, now I'm going to give it to someone. But then we go, I want $100 more. <laughs> well, it's just that. Especially no, now, right? And I, yeah. I, I see that. Well, but it, the, our first instinct is to help. 
so our first, in, if you're not given a lot of time, that first instinct, and I think that's what we see also in the street, like you see someone who trips and falls, you might want to go and help them, but research studies show that that is our first instinct, but we stop ourselves because of the norm of self-interest, so this idea that we're all selfish. So, and we stop ourselves because we think, well, if I go and help that person, maybe they think I want to get something from them. Aww. So it's, it's really interesting that way. I have these shoes that are, you know, and uh, I like them because uh, they're kind of hard to walk around in, but <clears throat> I use my balance in yeah. them, and uh, I kind of enjoy them, but I've, I've fallen in them, of course. Yeah. And uh, people have come up to me and helped me. That's awesome. <laughs> and I mean, like, full on, like, you know, like, on the floor. skin the knee and, yeah, in the middle of the street and, and things like that, and they help. And that, that makes me really happy when, when people reach out to me. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. And it's not like they were fans of my movie, you know. Oh. <laughs> my movies, the Christopher Guest fans. <laughs> but that's interesting you say that because we think we're going to be happy when we have all these achievements and so forth, but our greatest source of happiness is from helping, and it's like the best kept secret to happiness, because marketers out there don't want us to know that. They want us to think, purchase, achieve, whatever. And I'm so upset over all that. Yeah. I mean, do you remember commercials in the 70s that used to be so well-written and heartfelt and you'd cry, you know, they were human. The, mostly the, the English commercials were really right. like, wow. They had this interesting narrative form. And uh, I, I, wish, I wish that advertisers, and that's a whole other talk, I guess, but I, 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 wish, uh, I wish it was better here. We need to see that. We need to see actors portraying things yeah. that, are, uh, that have that sentiment. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting uh, in terms of acting is that what research shows is that when you see, so the person who helps you, so you fall, someone helps you, they feel better, you feel better, someone watches, there's somebody who definitely was on the street who saw that person approach you and mm -hmm. help you, that person feels elevated, so that's the term that psychologists use, elevation, which is that feeling you get when you see someone helping someone else and you feel moved on the inside, mm. you might even have tears sometimes that come. And, and that person is then more likely to help others. Mm -hmm. So, and it, up to three degrees of separation. So you falling generated this whole cycle. I can't wait to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> you can make it your daily act of kindness. I'm gonna do it, and I, I just joined social media, so I'm gonna you, YouTube myself, or I, <laughs> iPhone record myself. Yes, I love it. Just falling all the time, <laughs> and see who helps. And then I can hashtag write you in your book, <laughs> and then it'll... It's so funny. I wonder though if it, that's the same in movies, like if you watch someone helping someone else in a movie, whether that generates that same cycle of compassion or that yeah. sentiment. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I, I just think movies are so violent now, they mainly. Are. The people don't seem to be helping, you know, I don't see, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I can't answer that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, good ones, good ones. So tell me more about the, um, when, when you do, when you are in a film where you, um, where you're allowed to fully embody another person's feelings and engage empathically with your character, but also with the character you're interacting with. How do you, how do you generate that within you? I mean, I, scientifically, we know that we're built for that empathic response mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that we resonate with each other. Mm -hmm. So when I look at you and I can, you know, for example, if you were to scrunch your eyes or I can mm -hmm. see some emotion in your face, it reverberates within me. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about it, being an actress is that you're empathizing with your character and at the same time, you're Emphasizing with another character who you're interacting with, that's such a fascinating process. Yes, and so when you have actors that don't have crazy egos, yeah. and that they're open to, and, and the director is, you know, a lot has to do with casting the right people who have, can, can be open in a, in a certain way. Saying that, there can be an actor that's difficult which, and, and closed and competitive mm. and like kind of dark. But then that can create like a, 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 a more of a light or more of, of a, a, an op, you know, just 
more life or potency or um, make you shine brighter or that you have to like get in there, you know? Yeah. But I, um, and that, that is the work of, of, of acting is the psychology of the people around and, and your empathy mm. and your relatedness to them. So you, hopefully you're in a dialogue. You could be in a silent dialogue. I mean, sometimes you're just, you know, a director that you've worked with before can just give you a look and you kind of know, you know, mm. and it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, but when, yeah, the heart's in the right place and you accept the differences in everyone around you and you have empathy for the troubled souls and the, um, maybe you try to help or show something, maybe that takes away something of your character. Mm -hmm. So you create a boundary. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So it's like, it's like family in mm -hmm. a way. It's, it's like, you know, in the holidays when you go home for Christmas, mm -hmm. if you have a dramatic family or like everyone's, it's kind of like that, mm -hmm. that feeling. So you have to, you, everyone's on their toes, it's like heightened wow. in this way. It's, it's really interesting. So not only there's your relationship with the other actors and with the director and with the overall dynamics, and then there's a second layer of your character and their character. I mean, it's yeah, so yeah. multidimensional. Yeah, yeah. It can be a trip, and it's exhausting. And then, and then, <clears throat> it's hard to um, relate your experience to other people, even to your friends, because what you've just been through feels like your lifetimes a hundred. And so, it's like you're kind of going to bed with a book at night or with your imaginary friend who's your character. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, oh, I can't wait. Sometimes it's like, you know, and then you're, um, it's like alchemy, right? So then it's like all that other stuff is coming in, into your way. And it can't be against you. Mm -hmm. It can't be like, no, I don't, ex I don't accept that because then you like shut down. Right. Like everything has to be for you. And, um, and uh, it's a real, uh, um, it's a real lesson, you know, really. It's like a practice in a way, I guess. Yeah. Um, to get all, we are at the Ruby Museum. I can say a word like a practice and you guys can <laughs> nod your head. And, um, <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah. I still want to know so more tell about neuroscience, though. Let's talk about the phantom limbs stuff mm -hmm. that, that is so cool. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to um, like if someone's oh. arm is cut yeah. and um, you put a mirror over here and you... Well, they might feel even if they have a they limb have. that's missing, they feel, they can feel as if the limb is still there. Yeah, it's really fascinating. They pinch and they feel pinch, but there's there's no arm. There's no arm there, mm -hmm. but they see the arm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It is really fascinating, and um, it really brings a lot of questions about our existence, our physical existence, our mental existence. Like, where's what is the body? What's the mind? And you know. Um, I think scientists often will narrow things down to we are our brain and our brain alone. And yet some of these findings are more existential, I think. Um, yeah, do you think it's veering more? Because I have a few books of like on science and mysticism or there, there has been like a meld of the two, right? I do you think it's gone more towards science and less in that, in that way? Yeah, I think scientists try not Bless to go you. there. <laughs> and yet there's been a lot of research on meditation and um, uh, some findings that have been very surprising for people. For example, um, and I'm, I'm sure this audience is familiar with uh, research on neuroscience with monks uh, and that they found some, some extreme findings, for example, that um, their brains were particularly adept at, or particularly, I mean, um, Mathieu Ricard is obviously a well-known example of a monk who uh, is called the happiest man in the world because his brain was off the charts when it came to um, more positive emotions. And so um, we're seeing, you know, 
what we call the norm when we do studies, like on average, people's brains are you know, activated to this extent when they do this thing. We also see that our, we don't yet know the limits of human potential for happiness or for attention, for example. Um, research has shown that after meditation um, retreat, we, um, our attention is sharpened. So there's this cool study um, that looked at the attentional blink so basically, if we're shown a series of pictures or numbers very in very fast sequence, we'll miss every third or second image. We just register uh, maybe every third image, I think it is. Um, but after meditation retreat, people seem to register all of the images oh, wow. that they see. So somehow our attention is deepened, or maybe our attention becomes more normal, and we're usually so distracted. In fact, 50% yeah. um, of the time, our mind uh, wanders. So probably, in this, perhaps the audience can share with us, in the last um, few minutes that we've been speaking, how many of you have had your mind wander? We won't be offended. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> this show is over. <laughs> I will not accept that. Has your mind wandered? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Has yours? Of course. <laughs> It actually means we're normal. I know, right? <laughs> That'd be weird if like we're just like staring like this and kind of hypnotize each other all the time. But it's so it's interesting. <laughs> but in terms of happiness, actually, research shows that we are at our happiest when we're in the present moment, even if we're doing something that we're not enjoying. Um, <laughs> so that's just really interesting when you think about like the, the Buddhist and, and Vedic views of like happiness is in the present moment. That's cool. That's like in, in movies too, like if, when you're on camera with someone, mm -hmm. or even like we're on stage tonight, like there's, there's just a happiness that we're, all, that we're here in, in, in the moment right now, like talking like, and connecting. Um, yeah, at the, at the very basic level, that's what the, the acting world kind of gives, it's like a heightened experience of that, of that exchange, and it's so, it can be so amazing. So it's like a complete immersion with the with merger with the present moment. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. And psychologists call that flow, um, which is that, that state of being so immersed in the activity that you forget time, space, yeah, and yeah. you're in this. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic experience. Yeah, yeah I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blessed. I do get depressed, though. I'll just say that. I get very sad a lot. I just wanted to counteract all the happiness with <laughs> letting everyone know that, um, you know, in periods of suffering, it's, I mean, that, that's necessary. And I think, um, of course, lately, you know, when I knew I was going to talk to you, I was thinking, um, I wanted to ask you about frustration and what the mind is doing when it's frustrated and, um, Distracted, mm -hmm. and does your book help with that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean um, uh, what some some people um, I've noticed, especially men, use the word frustration when they mean anger? But I think you're meaning it in a different way. Um, yeah, um, I think I was just reading this book by the psychologist named Adam Phillips. Have you heard of him? Mm -hmm. Has anyone heard of him? so cool, um, on something in the nursery. And he was talking about the, the, the beast in the nursery and about how our first kind of feelings are frustration because mm -hmm. we, we have a relationship with the mother and we can't get, it, we can't get enough. And, mm -hmm. um, and then our happiness comes from the, the independence and creating our, our own world and our independence, but <clears throat> I just think that being an artist right now, is, which is not very nurturing, the culture is not nurturing right. the arts at all, mm -hmm. and it's awful, and that's where my frustration comes from, so, but I am mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you were talking I wouldn't about say I'm angry, like, but I'm really frustrated with it, because then I can, but I can always talk about ideas and be, mm -hmm. and be happy. And you were talking about distraction, too, as something that's frustrating? I think distraction's good. OK. I think it's like, I think distraction and denial have worked in my favor. 
Well, it's interesting in terms of an artist and <laughs> when we look at creativity and what generates that creativity, one of the things that, um, and I interviewed Nobel Prize winners and writers for, in, for my book in addition to looking at the science and um, the ability to um, diversify your experiences and your interests. So the most creative people are also those who aren't just narrowly focused on their field. Mm -hmm. They are also um, they also have outside interests that are totally different, mm -hmm. and it allows them to come back to their field and have these kind of breakthrough moments because there's connections that happen in their mind that wouldn't otherwise. Right. So in in, in a lot of ways, it makes sense that if you um, you know you call it distraction, but maybe you're engaging with very different kinds of activities and yes. how that can help then make you feel more nurtured when you go back to your profession, your creative yes. mm -hmm. profession. Yep, you're right. You're right, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> but you were just saying something that um, that made me. Oh yeah. So I was going to say. I mean, uh, it, from what we hear, that the world of Hollywood and acting and so forth can be quite um, quite a harsh one too mm -hmm. to work in. And what do you do to um, be able to be at your maximum potential in terms of yourself as an artist? Um, within that um, culture, and I think, you know, for, for many, many people struggle with uh, workplaces where the culture is aggressive or competitive or just negative. And so, and it's something we all have to contend with, whether it's in a workplace or, or you know, for some people, they volunteer in an organization and they're passionate about that, but yet this nonprofit has all these negative issues too. Yeah, right. So we all contend with that and we all have a desire to contribute to the best of our ability and yet. So tell me, how do you, um, what do you do to nurture yourself to make yourself strong in those environments? No. Um, I think in the work, it, it, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're entering into um, a world, um, and that's always fun, even though it has its challenges. I think what you're talking about could be the aftermath of what, it means to be in a movie, what, uh, you know, uh, talking about it or um, the challenges that come from uh, too many projections coming mm -hmm. at you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably, um, how do I, I don't know, I just, uh, how do I deal with that? It's constant connecting, you know, and reaching. A, with other people. With other people, yeah. 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 Well, that, and that's, I mean, fundamentally, that's what the research shows. If, you, if I were to boil down the science of happiness, it lies in our positive relationships with other people and very much nurtured by also that spirit of empathy and kindness and um, that us reaching out to others. And so many people feel like, I'll be happy if people love me, if people admire me. If, and so in the yes. end, it makes you focus on yourself. And I'm sure you've seen that in some actors where yes. they are just looking for that. <laughs> and yet... Even when you get all of that, you won't be happy because that happiness really comes from extending yes. toward a hand towards someone else. Yes, that's so true. And it's so weird when people don't think that that's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of shocking. When it's the best when kept secret. When you're in a, like, a weird, you know, because I think s some people in my business like to um, either unconsciously probably completely unconsciously, um, intimidate others with their own power, mm. right? So it's, it can be like lots of, you know, um, ego battles, and it makes them very interesting. People are compelled by this, like, you know, behavior. And sometimes there are people around that have the same kind of thing going mm -hmm. on and they're not even in, you know, in the, in the world. And it's hard to connect with them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's, that can be really challenging, actually, yeah. a feeling like alienated. I think alienating, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's really interesting you mentioned that because at the end of the day, so, you know, perhaps those kind of people, they're trying to project an image or something to get attention because they actually want to connect, but they think they're going to connect by asking for attention, and in the end, they feel actually isolated and lonely, and that actually is linked to, you know, feelings of, of you know, unhappiness and also deep 
unhappiness, yeah. right? Like no center, like no like cozy blanket, like this is mine, I, how are you today? You know, yeah. like can't even do that. Yeah, but what's really interesting is that a lot of people then think, oh my gosh, I don't have friends or I'm introverted, I'm shy or I, I am a working mom and I just don't have time to connect. However, um, what the research shows is it doesn't have anything to do with how many friends you have. It has to do with your subjective feeling of connection. So you seem like someone who does, who from the inside feels connected to others and that's yeah. the nurturance and I think that's the beauty of what Sharon is also teaching us, that idea that we can build our sense of connection to others from within and so it doesn't matter if you have a ton of friends or not you can feel that connection and we see that in people like you probably have people who sometimes walk on set and they connect with everyone from the you know the the light guys to the other actors and they they're that kind of person they come mm -hmm. in and they uplift like you were saying yeah. you like to uplift people and they feel connected and it's that same thing you see in a child like a child will come in and I'll be like will you play with me they don't care if they know your name. It yeah. doesn't matter. Who mm -hmm. cares, right? Mm -hmm. And that is that spirit of connection from within. And the beauty of that is we can all nurture that no matter yeah. how lonely we are. And I love that research because it's really what, it, to me, really fundamentally what being human is all about. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. You say it so well. <laughs> you see, I can... That's like you're, you wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like I followed it, and it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Oh. <laughs> I've been writing and talking about this. Yeah, yeah. It's so. Yeah. And to yeah, it's a shame when we lose that, but um, I think it's. Uh, I like to go back to that, you know, yeah. like the happiest moment. Like I had a really someone asked me. When I was talking about it, I was going to talk about happiness. Like, what was your happiest moment? And I remember being like eight years old and, you know, outside of the house in Louisiana. And um, I w had on one of these um, zip up pajama yeah. like onesies, onesies. <laughs> with like the, with the hood. And I was yeah. all, and I was just sitting outside. I was waiting for spring to come. Yeah. <laughs> and my dad That's took a awesome. picture and he came outside. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like I'm just waiting for the spring to come. And there was a, watching the uh, Marlon Brando, uh, Listen to Me Marlon documentary, too, about um, it goes back to his childhood and just those moments, like constantly. When it, whenever I feel um, kind of sad, I like to go back to that. I go back to that place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, Did I turn this into therapy? <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow, 4.30. <laughs> but what's really interesting about what you say, and thanks for sharing about, you know, the fact that you feel sad sometimes. I mean, we all do. I mean, that's oh, yeah, just the nature. Such, yeah, yeah. But the beauty of that, too, is that then we really, when we do feel those joyful moments, um, that contrast allows those moments to be so much more vibrant because yeah. we've felt the opposite. If and so there's this beauty that comes in opposites. And I think also this sense of gratitude that can come. And um, I mean, research shows that a lot. Like when you when you feel gratitude, it amplifies your happiness. It's your physical and psychological health improves. Blah blah blah. But um, and sometimes that contrast can really. For example, um, so I just had a baby about 13 months ago, and uh, he um, he just didn't want to sleep at night um, for a whole year, and uh, so I had never had anything. I mean, my sleep had always been protected my whole life, and I was great. I loved sleep, and I, it was awesome. And here I just experienced no sleep, and you're, you can't sleep. You're not allowed to sleep because, and so it was so interesting. Now he, recently he started sleeping till four o'clock in the morning. And um, I've just been like, sleep is so amazing. Does everybody yeah, realize yeah. that sleep is so amazing? <laughs> yeah. Are you sleeping through the night tonight? Are you going to sleep a whole <laughs> seven hours? Do you know how lucky you are? That's so, so great. sometimes that contrast is so amazing. But the same things, when those moments mm -hmm. in our life when we can feel so down, mm -hmm. and yet, and then when you feel, you know, yeah. those moments of connection, that yeah. contrast. Yeah, and especially, you know, I think. So many of us have really stressful jobs, and we yeah. work so hard, and we work too hard, and now this thing is like our work, and our personal life is our yeah. work, and our, and then everyone's just kind of like in a hamster wheel of um, speedy, 
you know, speediness. Yeah. And, you know, they can't get off, and then they crash. Exactly right. And yeah. then they, but there, there's this stress. Like, can as you know, as, as artist or designer, it's it's really you know, it's 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 hard to, um, you know, to trust the universe, and. Uh, I've seen my friends, you know, go through really dire things of like, I don't know how it's all going to come together. You know, I, I have to move out of my apartment. I have to, and you see that things do shift, and then they, they shift in a in a better direction. And um, but yeah, I've been knocked out yeah. by stress. Mm -hmm. I have been knocked out, and I've seen friends knocked out like nervous breakdown kind of thing, Absolutely. you know, just like exhaustion and just like, like a shutdown. And you feel like, you know, and we're at the Reuben. Um, you, feel like, you feel like the spirit world just like came and just like attacked you and said, would you stop it? Yeah. You know, and just like knock you out. It's so um, interesting. You know, like. Yeah. Well, I mean, stress is. Because it's demanding. Don't you feel like. There's a lot more in our work life, and obviously oh, yeah. that that the the gadgets have put a demand yes. on us that is like too that much. we're experiencing it's too much, and we don't quite know how to we don't stay human. It's it's such a good point, and we're seeing burnout across industries, like 50% or more of people across, whether it's a nonprofit or um, across a number of organ of industries. There's so yeah. much burnout, and I mean, even with, it's so interesting with email, like in the past, you might have had a couple experiences during the day that make you emotionally upset. Maybe your landlord or is pissed off or this or that, or your mom calls and is mad or whatever yeah. it is. But now you can open your inbox and you have 30 new emails. Each one can generate a different yes. emotion. Yes. Within 10 minutes, you've gone through the whole <laughs> <Yeah>. spectrum. <laughs> After, here, that's enough. You can go back to bed right there. Like, yes. Just, you're exhausted. Yes. So you've lived like a week. Yes. With the day of the email that you just read. Exactly. It would have been like two weeks, uh, two you know, weeks 15 worth. years ago. Yeah. And so it is. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It's there, and also the speed of life, because you need to give an answer right away. Mm. If someone wants an answer right now, they're going to text you rather than email you. <laughs> and you're just like, oh my god. I mean, it's really um, demanding. hugely demanding. And I think we haven't even realized that. Because like you said, we didn't have this in our life 20 years ago. Mm. And it's happening, and we all haven't learned to manage it. And not only are, is the technology interrupting us, but we are interrupting ourselves to, I'm sorry, everybody, but I have to. <laughs> and so we are going. Into, this loop, into these loops. And I mean, one of the reasons is that we get this little high whenever we get novelty. So the brain responds to novelty mm -hmm. with a little bit of a high. So you're like, oh, I got a text message or like a notification of some sort. So we start to get addicted to that. What is it called? The crackberry or whatever? Ex the expression yeah, of the yeah. crackberry. But um, we, I don't think we've gained consciousness of what it's actually doing to our nervous system. And the other thing is that we don't have those moments anymore for daydreaming and, yeah. um, and re, I mean, this is, you, know, you were asking about the brain and creativity comes in those moments and I'm sure you've had those when you're Alone. idle, when you're um, daydreaming, when you're spacing out, when you're goofing off and, yeah, yeah. and nowadays, I mean, people sleep with their cell phones so it's like you wake up and it's like you don't even look at your partner or your mm -hmm. child's eyes first. Mm -hmm. The first thing you look at is your mm -hmm. screen. You know what I mean? So I, I think there's definitely, there's, there's something going on. We're going to have to learn I was going to say, I was like, okay, I was like, I have a pillowcase with like a little pocket. <laughs> on my phone. I'm selling them on Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> so dot, That's dot, awesome. <laughs> iPhone pocket pillow, parkercozy.org. I think it's going to do very well. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. <laughs> you like sleeping on it. No, people will sleep with their phone <clears throat> under their pillow, just that, so they don't miss a buzz. Well, I mean, I know a lot of people will do that. I. That's weird. Have you seen that um, Strange Addictions, that show? No. Where people are eating toilet paper <laughs> and glass. Yeah. Like, and sleeping with a hair dryer. Why? I, it's like, this is true, because it's like, it's just something psychological and... Nurturing? And nurturing to them that uh, like some story 
something, her past, uh, the hum of the hair dryer and the heat of the hair dryer. And then the experts come in and say, you can't do that because <laughs> you could electrocute yourself in your sleep. And, and they try to get her to stop doing it. And uh, yeah, don't eat uh, dryer uh, softener cleaner. Oh. Do, don't eat the bounce. Thanks for letting me know. Don't eat the, stop eating the, the dryer. What do they call drying? Um, dryer sheets, yeah, don't eat the dryer sheets. They're really bad for you and your stomach. <laughs> They do, the, you know, they make you, they give you all sorts of problems. And she's like, I really want to eat that. So, I mean, we're going, we're getting, yeah, cracked out. They're cracking. And then you wonder, like, is it the cult? Like, what's doing all that? Or has everyone always been kind of crazy like that? Anyway. But, um, you know, you are such a playful spirit. And I am. Yeah. Um, it's the dress. It has to do with what I'm wearing. <laughs> but research shows that, you know, um, uh, hum humans are the only mammals who stop playing after childhood. If you, if you have a cat or dog, you'll see that they're going to continue playing their whole life. And, um, but you have such a playful nature and yeah. you bring that out in, yeah. in all of us. Oh, I'm glad. And um, it's a real gift. Thank you. And something that I think a lot of people could, could learn from. Oh, you have something in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I like you eat the bug. <laughs> 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 oh, get me off the stage. Can we, um, <laughs> should we open up to questions yeah, now? Yeah, that's a good idea. Ask Emma. <laughs> Look, someone left. You're like, I'm out of here. You have a question, sir. So, so could it come, hands up already. Like, so did I cut that short? Either side of the house. So we've got two questions already on this side of the house. Um, so let's do that. And then we've got a question right at the back as well, Chelsea. Great. Thanks. Yes. Who had the hand up first? Thank you. Me? Yes, you. Is, is it on? We yes, always it say is that on. at we scientific conferences. Talk. Um, I have a question about um, the sense of humor and how we all use it to maintain stability, happiness, et cetera. So I'm an academic scientist, and it is a hard time in the world for us as well. Mm -hmm. And the, some of us uh, appreciate Parker's work because she is a genius at, this, ah. at humor. Yes, she is. OK? Sorry. So I can come home <laughs> destroyed, and I watch a Parker film, and I am ready for the next day. Oh, thank and, you. Thank well, and similarly, in our group, in our department, et cetera, we run, if we're at universities, the faculty do everything. The students do some things. But the faculty do everything, and we're, we, you know, it's tough, and, we're, and then we use humor to have these, like, moments of intense appreciation for each other that carries all the working together, uh, you know, webs it all together. And so my question is, to, to both of you, to Parker, how does the, the sense of humor that you clearly have and you're a master at in your work work into your long-term happiness? And then I wanted to ask Emma, what do we know about the neurobiology of the sense of humor's uh, release of neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, et cetera? I just thought of this. You know the term when blue, wear red. You know, I think there's like that humor really comes from well, it, it came from my funny parents. And um, I, uh, in a way, I'm from the South. I don't know. I don't know where. I, I know it, I, <clears throat> I have a hard time having some time. Um, OK, you would be surprised at like the sour, pussed, funny people. Um, and <clears throat> that some of the funniest people can be like, very serious and intense. Does that surprise you? No. You hear about the funny, cl the clowns that are, you know. Oh, the sad clown, that's yeah. right. You all know about that. <laughs> well, um, yeah, tell it's us true. More. It's so interesting. It's true, and it's interesting. It's um, because it's constant, like, um, I don't know if it's exactly a roller coaster ride, um, but you're deeply affected by things, and things make you upset. And then you kind of have to like get out of that. And the way you get out of that is a sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, hopefully you have a funny friend that reminds you, you know, 
and it's like yeah. witty, and then you're like, oh yeah, that's right, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm all funny again. Yeah. But sometimes it's, um, you know, those periods as we get older and more aware mm -hmm. of life passing and time and all of that, it gets more, uh, it gets more interesting and uh, um, delicate and, um, and I, I think I'm happier as I get older, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually. Research shows that too. Yeah, research, mm -hmm. oh, cool. research shows that because when the more aware we are of the finiteness of time, the more we start to live in the moment and the more we start to appreciate what we have. Yeah. So, so. what age would you, would you say that's <laughs> Actually, That wasn't a joke. It's really, <coughs> it's really your, the finiteness of time. So you could be 20 years old and just know, I don't know how many more days I have to live. Or you could be 80 and be like, oh, maybe I'm approaching the end of my life. But um, so. I had no idea. I've been like <laughs> acting like a 20-year-old the whole time. I was an 80-year-old woman. That's so great. I love her. <clears throat> it's so interesting that you say that because I worked a lot with veterans um, coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, they, uh, we, we did some meditation interventions with them. Uh, and uh, they have... The only thing, well, the main thing that keeps them together, both when they're in, in a war zone, but also when they're in training, and the trainings are so hellish, is their sense of humor. And, it, um, and you were asking about the science. So the sense of humor and, uh, is, it bonds people. It helps mm -hmm. connect you. And that's why you're, mm -hmm. you do such an amazing job of connecting every, all of us in the room. <laughs> and it creates that, because we share in this positive emotion. So like mm -hmm. you said, that... Um, you know, you said that you'd like to uplift people. It creates this mutual upliftment. Mm -hmm. And so in the military especially, it's a hyper-masculine environment. Even though they're women, they're, it's hyper-masculine, not touchy-feely, and you're going through these really rough experiences. And so one of the only ways is um, that connection. That's, but I, I want to share a story based on that. So there's this military Facebook humor page called um, Shit My Drill Sergeant Said. And um, they post these um, military humor, which can be crass and whatever, yeah. but it makes, it makes them laugh. And, um, and one day, um, one of the guys who, who manages the page got this message, and he, it said, uh, my friend has disappeared, he has a gun, uh, and his cell phone is off, and we're really scared that he's going to commit suicide. And so that, that, that the leader of that page posted on Facebook and said, all jokes are off right now. Um, this person is in this state. This is what's going on. And all night long, there was like over 100 comments. People got in their cars, started driving toward the state. And by 4.30 in the morning, they had located this person, saved his life. And he called, that, he called that, the people managing that page and left a voicemail, which is online. And I, I heard it. I just wanted to cry because he was saying, um, thanks for caring. And um, you know, wow. because of you, I'm alive today. And um, just to show, so it's such a ex vibrant example of like this playfulness and this humor that connects, and yet it's so linked to this deep humanity and love and connection mm -hmm. to one another. Mm -hmm. So it's a great Thank question. question. Thank you. Um, just, we're going to be exploring that uh, whole topic uh, further in the Brainwave series uh, when uh, Bob Mankoff, the cartoonist, is going to be on stage with Scott Weems talking about how humor and laughter. Uh, what it generates in us as a community. So um, if you want to explore that subject further, uh, please join us then. There was a second question, yes? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I don't know if this is a question, but I just wanted to point out that in listening to the points brought up of being, the idea of being in the moment seems to be very important and the flow and the connection. But then there's also the negative component of being in the moment and picking up your phone and not letting your mind wander. And they seem to be in contrast with each other. And it makes me think that there is something we're missing. And it's not just about being in the moment yeah. or not being in the moment yeah. and letting our minds flow. And in fact, it makes me wonder whether all of the hard work in finding happiness for all of us has to do with this multidimensional space of who we were when we were kids what our parents were to us, where we are now. All, there's so many things. And when you stop and let your mind wander, what happens is you either retrieve memories from the past or you think about the future. And if your mood or your past has been bleak, 
then you think about bleak things. But if your mood is uplifted, even momentarily, by good interaction on the street, then you might tend to remember better memories. So there's a lot more complexity to the, it's not just about being in the moment or letting your mind wander. It's all the hard work yeah. that we need to do all the time to figure out who we are and to like think about our relationships with other people and kind of mend the, you know, so anyway, it's not really a question, but it's more like you brought up this duality. And I think yeah. in that duality, there's an answer that's a lot harder that isn't necessarily being addressed or I don't know what you guys think about that. I think that's beautiful, and that just it makes me think of this one study that recently came out where people were told to sit in a room, and they were told, don't do anything, just sit there. And, but if you get bored, here's this machine you can give yourself electric shocks with or something. <laughs> people prefer to give themselves electric shocks than sit there and do nothing. Wow, wow. <laughs> we are in so much trouble. <laughs> we are in trouble. Yeah. Wow. And then the, the, even the, the uh, scientist who ran it was interviewed, and he was like, I was, I was telling people not to do anything, and I'd have to go in there. They'd be making to-do lists or something. <laughs> yeah. So that's, it's really interesting. That's, uh, yeah, that's crazy. I, th I want to, I want to meet, that, that sounds fascinating, this, 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 do you know this man who came up with that test? I don't know him personally, but I could just definitely send you the information. Okay. <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm gonna follow him on, on social media. <laughs> um, yeah, but you, are you a writer? No, I'm actually a scientist. I study memory. And I study the resting state, where your mind goes when you tell people to do nothing. It's Dr. Lila Debarchi, everybody, uh, who uh, is an expert in memory and has participated in Brainwave before. Lovely to have you in the audience, Lila. But to your point, yeah, we are such multidimensional individuals. It's just hard to narrow things down. And there's that benefit to staying in the moment, um, to really uh, feel and connect. And, and at the same time, it's when we're, our mind is wandering that we sometimes have those breakthrough notions. So it's this absolutely beautiful, like you said, not you know, dual experience of being human. Yeah. So uh, can I just interject, because you've been quite critical about the whole um, uh, intersection of uh, the personal device into your personal life, and yet, Park, you've resisted social media for so long. Why now? I'm in the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, I just... Uh, it's a big, it's a big uh, shift in the culture, what's happening to storytelling, and I think it's involving this, this screen and you know, podcasts and listening and different, I think there are different ways to be creative in the new. I felt like I was out of time and out of touch. Um, so I just felt like it was time to finally get a computer. And uh, <laughs> I got a screen name, and uh, so <laughs> uh, I want to make new things, and it's going to involve being tech savvy, or at least knowing people who are and who can help me. Um, yeah, I, I had some more things to say, but I forgot. I got It'll distracted. be a medium for you to keep uplifting people in another way and reach, you know, you can do it in a very broad way. So social media has that potential too to really inspire. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to make things something that like bridges the gap, you know, the space of, uh, you know, narrative, storytelling, music, mm -hmm. um, spoken word. I do a lot of readings at Selected Shorts. I like being lost in a story. I love the art of, you know, a great storyteller, an actor who can really inhabit yeah. the literature. And there's so many great actors here in the city and and I just feel like they're so they're underutilized. We're in like very, you know, we're in that time. Um so yeah, I'm taking meetings and stuff to try to make things. We look forward to that. Ah. It takes work. It does. It's yeah. like, it takes courage. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Yeah, and it takes being like, yeah, 
a weirdo um, and being okay with that. It's surprising how blah, blah, blah. But I think that, Parker, that your, your authenticity and your vulnerability and your um, willingness to be all out there as a person it gives other it's people... It's really hurt your career. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. <laughs> um, I know it has. <laughs> It gives other people permission to be themselves, and it's a huge gift. Um, I think that w I think that uh, others would agree with me uh, on that. Yeah. That's sweet. Thank you. Um. We've got another question. Okay, right in the back. Yes, you had your hand up. Hi. I thought you could um, talk a little bit about if you think happiness can be a choice. You know that if you choose to be happy. Um, or not, and also for Emma, just the the thought that um, certain thoughts can create an actual neural pathway, and that you can try and unlearn or undo those negative thoughts that that happen. I have a real aversion. I'm going to admit this to you now, to the to the word happy, <laughs> <laughs> because. It's, I remember seeing like the, the yellow smiley face, you know, in the mm -hmm. 70s yeah. and, and it feeling like it was like... Acid rock. Like what? Acid rock. Acid rock. Um, and that happiness was other things like exuberance or curiosity. And I, when I thought about it, I was like, I started making up other words for happy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but I don't think... Can you choose? Um, that's a really deep question. Um, no. no, I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer it. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's interesting too because if you ask um, people in the United States, what does happiness mean? They'll define it as high intensity, positive emotions. They say excitement, enthusiasm, elation, thrill. And then you go to East Asia. And You're like, that's a drug problem. <laughs> <laughs> but in China or East, um, Japan or Korea, you say, what is happiness? And they'll say contentment, peacefulness, calm. Right. So again, uh, it really depends on you know, how we define it. But in terms of, you, know, you were saying, can you create it as a habit? One thing we know that we have as a habit is we have a negativity bias, which means that, you know, um, uh, I think uh, the research shows that we have three times more positive things that happen to us on a daily basis than negative. And yet, if one negative thing happens to us, all of a sudden our entire day is ruined, right? Yet we live in this first world country, we've probably had three or four meals, we have, you know, sleep in a warm bed, hopefully, and you know, we have the luxury of spending an evening here together. I mean, there's so many things that are going right. And yet, you know, your cabbie was crabby or your, it was raining and your sh new shoes got wet or something. And all of a sudden, the whole day is just terrible. So that's the negativity bias. And then the other thing we do is um, we habituate, which means we get used to things. So say you meet the love of your life, finally, and you get married and, you know, you're just so happy, and then you see them every single day. And then you're like, oh my gosh, you forget. Like, and then you're like, oh, that person. You know, so that, but that's what our, our mind does. And so those are two things we know that are, we do. And so we, we get used to what we have, and then we forget how lucky we are. Um, and that's where gratitude comes in, um, you know, remembering on a daily basis as a practice um, but also when you watch the news, like, I, you know, if you've been, you know, following what's going on with Syrian refugees and just thinking about that, you know, all the news is coming out about the kids and how, uh, you know, 10,000 of them are unaccounted for. And then you think of your own child that's safe, and, and, but you think, oh my gosh, what's going on? I mean, there's such a contrast. And if on a daily basis we just realize, like, we are just so fortunate. And how are we choosing to spend our days? Like, are we choosing to spend it focused on ourselves or are we choosing to make a difference? And we were talking earlier too, like if we really realize how much time we have left and we, if we really think about what will we have want to have done in this life if we were to be on our deathbed now, you know, and I think that's something we should 
we can really think about. And mm. I think that can, happiness or no happiness, like are we happy with how we're spending our days or hours mm -hmm. and what we're doing? Um, so those, those are just some thoughts on that question. And but when you described um, what Americans feel like and what uh, people yeah. from uh, another country in the East might feel like, uh, what you're describing about what Americans seem to identify as happiness is rather egocentric behavior. Uh, because it's all about gratification for themselves, mm -hmm. as opposed to the contentment of finding a connection with landscape and, and community, which is selfless behavior, mm -hmm. because it's shared. So can you talk a little bit about that relationship? Well, it's interesting, because if you do look at East Asian communities, the identity is not ar around the self, but it's around the group. Mm -hmm. So my family, my community, my society, so it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily entirely selfless because it's about my group, right? right? Yeah. As opposed to another group. But I do think that um, what in the, in the US, because of that high intensity, even, so you were saying we're so adrenaline focused, like we are so stress driven and we actually choose to be stressed in a lot of ways. Some people are, wait till the last minute for to do their taxes or to do something in order to have that adrenaline rush to just get it done. Or we over caffeinate or we uh, over schedule ourselves. We are kind of um, married to this high intensity life. Drama queens. <laughs> <laughs> and so feeling, wanting to feel excitement and elation and that's also high intensity. So it's like that work hard, play hard. And there's nothing right. wrong with that. I mean the fact that we live in this culture, we like feelings like excitement. It's, it's mm -hmm. fun for us, um, but we, it's interesting in terms of energy management. I think we could really balance our life more with more nurturing, calming things. And we were just talking earlier, I was sharing that when I lived in New York, I, it was so um, nerve wracking that I had to do something extreme to balance it. And I would go to Bikram Yoga. Yeah, we were talking about <laughs> Bikram Yoga. And I went there for a while too at uh, Union Square and I felt like it was too intense, mm -hmm. you know? It's like a little too much. It's sure. like an hour and a half, first yeah. of all. It's $20, <laughs> and they torture you. Like, they, they, they treat you like he's like military, and they're proud that it's militant yoga. Yeah. And I liked the like, oh, I love to sweat. I just uh, get all the toxins out, and you know, there's something kind of great about a group of people uh, practicing yoga together, and, um, but I would, uh, the first hour was a standing series and then you get on the floor and I made a habit of after an hour going like, I forgot, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you. And I realized that that was part of why I, you know, gave the money to take the class was to be like, no, I actually have a limit with you Bikram Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. And now I can, now I can leave. <clears throat> but um, yeah, now I do, well, I need to get back into my yoga practice. Um, blah, blah, blah. But it's funny, yeah, how, these, how intense we are, mm -hmm. right? It kind of, when I do something really intense, it feels feels like capitalist in a way, like, oh, the thing that's the most good, craziest, you know, and I did that. Yeah. Um, but I did do it, but I kind of didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you approached it. But I think it's really interesting because I think, you know, there's this whole movement towards mindfulness in the U.S. and it's gotten so big. And I think that it's happening because we have to balance that intensity too. We just can't always be at that level of intensity and it's providing some balance to yeah. what we're facing either by choice or that it's being imposed on us. Mm -hmm. um, and actually I started meditating when I was in New York City because I needed a way to balance that. And I remember like two days ago when I just arrived or last week when I arrived, I was walking through the streets and thinking this is such a crazy place. And then I, I had this thought in my heart like thank you New York because of you. I learned how to meditate because I needed to find a balance and it's been such a gift. But it's it de really yeah, it demands a lot of you. I love that. I love the awareness that the city demands of, of, of everyone. And I think it's like, I still think it's a miracle that we can all live on top of each other in <laughs> tiny apartments. And you know, it's just, it's, it's great. 
and uh, it's not too, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, harmony in, in the city. Mm -hmm. um, but that, I'm having a good week, you know, and a good few weeks. Like a year ago, I w I'd be probably crabbier, like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway. Oh, I'm boring myself. <laughs> <laughs> then let's liven it up. We've got a question on this side of the house. And who else keep your hand up? Blah, blah. And this gentleman here, please. Hi. Um, I just want to um, thank both of you so much. Um, it's been such a, um, a delight listening to both your perspectives. Um, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really uh, interesting. And thank you for bringing an interesting um, combination to the stage, yeah. <laughs> especially the colors. Yeah. Um, the, I, I would say though, of course, and I think the, you know, it, it's, um, it's not unconsidered in this evening, but the difference between talking about pleasurable um, emotional states versus um, lasting contentment and purpose um, and those are two very different things. So I think um, the idea, Parker, I, I appreciate so much what you said about um, having some aversion to the term happy. And from the Buddhist philosophy, right, we would be saying, you know, the, the pursuit of happiness is what creates suffering in our life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's something that really needs to be rethought. And um, Emma, thank you so much for all your work. I followed you. It's been wonderful. I appreciate it. Um, and the idea about mindfulness, um, and again, from the larger perspective of mindfulness, it's being mindful of that which creates suffering and that which creates contentment. And unfortunately, when we are, are focused on a momentary, fleeting, impersonal emotional reaction, which both of you spoke to so beautifully that these things are arising and passing and we don't know what's causing them half the time and you know, who knows? Um, and we put too much stock in them and we get off course to what truly creates lasting happiness. Um, and so I, I would just love to hear both of your thoughts on, on that subject and maybe just flesh out that we're talking about two different things. Thank you. Does that make sense? Thank you. I, um, you make me think of um, self-criticism mm -hmm. and how awful and hard that is to have empathy for ourselves when we start to self-criticize. And um, I just got stuck there. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> um, but just the, the, you know, how um, we don't talk about that. And that's, that's suffering. Mm -hmm. And um, it's another... You know, we need, it's great to be here, you know, this has been so nice, Tim, and to share this dialogue with you, Emma, because I feel, you know, I feel better. Um, <laughs> um, but I don't know how to, to answer your question, as, but just to, to uh, we, need, we need more language, we need more expression of it in, in the arts, I mean, I, yeah, I, I I hope, I hope to be a part of making things that contribute to that kind of state of mind so that we can all be our creative, lovely selves in our homes and in our lives. And I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I know I'm like problem solving, <laughs> um, yeah. but go ahead. You already are a gift. Oh, thank you. That's sweet. Thank you. <laughs> um, Sweat. I like <laughs> it's interesting you bring up self-criticism because right? it's the worst. I mean, aren't we in that all the time? Yeah, and I bring it up and I brought it up in a whole chapter in the book just because it's so prevalent. And um, what it actually, if you look at the research, what it does is self -sub it's basically self-sabotage. Yeah. And there's all this research coming out on self-compassion, which is basically treating yourself as you would a friend. That shows that that makes you more resilient, more happy. It makes you more likely to learn and grow from your mistakes. And yet... So often we get caught up in self-criticism. I was just thinking of an analogy the other day. Let's say you're training for a marathon and you're in the marathon and you're like, oh my God, this is the big day. And you're running, maybe the New York City Marathon, and you trip and fall because maybe you're wearing cute shoes. Yeah, I'm wearing <laughs> and <laughs> that. that was me you were talking about. <laughs> and you have a, you have, there's someone on the sideline there and that person says, 
you're a failure, you can't run, why are you even doing this? Like, and how you would feel versus someone on the sidelines saying, everybody falls. That's just what you do. Yeah. You can totally do this, get right back up. I know you can do it, although you can make mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that difference, like we just viscerally probably can feel how that different that would feel. And yet we are that person on the sideline, but we yeah. don't realize it. And self-compassion is treating yourself like you would a friend, like that second person. And it can be so challenging. But going back to your point, in the brain, it looks really different if you have, uh, if you derive happiness from pleasure, like for example, you know, the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or chocolate. <laughs> um, it, it, it gives you this spike of dopamine release and you get this little high and then a dip again, which is why you want more. And evolutionarily, that was a good thing because, because you desire more food or more sexual partners, that's how you reproduce, that's how you stay alive, that's how you, you know, and so forth. So it was, it's a good thing that that system is in place. And yet there's another system that is um, derived from, like you said, those feelings that are more, uh, of connection, of purpose, of meaning. And that happiness, or even maybe the word, right, would be contentment or even fulfillment. As I like to use the word fulfillment because that is different. Um, that is much more long lasting, even, um, even at the, um, the biochemical level, it's, it, it, it's, it leads to a much longer lasting feeling of um, pleasure and, and meaning is a big part of that. So, but again, you know, we're human beings and we're, we've been given this earth, there's no reason we shouldn't experience pleasure. That's part of the fun of life, you know, as long as you don't get caught up in it, into this cycle where you think that's all there is. Um, so let's enjoy ourselves, but at the same time realizing that, you know, it's that sense of purpose and, and love and compassion and something outside of ourselves. Like, what are we doing to make this place better? If we keep that in our hearts as well, then I think, I think that's a life well lived. That's my own opinion. It's so beautifully said. You've actually touched on the, the fundament of Buddhist philosophy, which is the utilization of all your senses, that is, includes the sixth sense, consciousness, in order to understand the connectivity of everything. Mm -hmm. which, and that's that sense of balance that will give you the lasting sense of contentment and happiness. So that's, that's really inherent in, in this whole idea of how to conduct yourself through life and anticipate death with that mm -hmm. in mind and in body, right? Yeah. We have a brief question. Well, here. I mean, you've largely just touched upon what I was going to ask. I mean, just what, what, what is, what just is your... Just to make uh, the question shorter, that's all. Well, oh, yeah, I mean, what, what's your, what's your uh, personal connections to failure, and does that, uh, how does that uh, lead you to happiness or begrudgingly or, uh, or inevitably or constructively? I mean, like, how, what is your, um, yeah, what, what is your, uh, how useful is failure? in um, finding happiness. <clears throat> Emma, why don't you go first? <laughs> um, are you asking scientifically or are you asking personally? Uh, sure. Yeah, because I have a thing about the word failure. Well, I mean, there's the failure that you have at your muscles at the gym and all of that, which is a really great thing. Right. I will talk about something that happened to me, though, in, related to what you just said. Um, a few weeks before I started working on the Woody Allen movie, I broke my wrist. And I needed a, uh, I had wrist surgery. And uh, I thought I was going to be fired. And um, then I thought I was going to be cut from the film. And then I'd take my splint off during, and I'd, even to hold my purse was like, it was painful. You can look at that as like failure. You know, my body failed me in a creative situation where I needed to have everything together. Um, but it, you know, it gave me a lot. It gave me a lot. Some strength. Yeah, it gave it gave me a lot of strength to uh, of of uh, you know having to uh, having to hold on to like this this injury. Mm -hmm. You know, and to to examine it and to, to carry it, you know, and I find myself working and I would just like look at my, my hand, you know, and I just like hold it. Um, so I don't, um, if, you re if you're asking about like failures that are beyond your control or stuff like that, like from the outside, I think it's, um, 
you know, someone once said the only rejection is self-rejection. My therapist said that, my first therapist. <laughs> and I like that a lot. Um, so yeah, I just, when I, th when I hear the word failure, I just think of football. I get, like, my mind just goes somewhere else. Explain that, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know. Why does it? <laughs> that's so. Well, in terms of the, uh, you know, what we just talked about with self-criticism, I think that's, you know, I mentioned that scientifically, but I think on a personal level, failure has led me to always a state of surrender. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I've made a mistake, and all that I can do right now is to let go. And when I've gotten to that place is when I felt like I could move on. You know, you could either hang on and be like, I'm so terrible, I'm so terrible, or you can say, that person's so terrible, that person's the res responsible for my failure. Um, but none of those will take you anywhere. But when you really come to that point where you're so low that the only thing you do is put your forehead on the floor and say, surrender, because there's nothing I can do. And I have no answers. That, I think, has led to the greatest, um, I don't know, it's, that's just been a blessing to be able to do that. It's now not very scientific. That's beautifully said, Emma. And now I know what he's talking about. It's not football. <laughs> <laughs> um, those moments of feeling like a failure um, are common to yeah. me and my friends. Um, and uh, yeah, you kind of, uh, you, you said it better than I would, but yeah, surrender. And, um, and there's strength of vulnerability. There's strength in sharing your brokenness and your uh, unsureness of, of your situation and whether, it's just a very human thing. Very human. I think when people are really vulnerable with each other and um, yeah. Mm. It's interesting that last question was about a failure because Emma's book is about success. <laughs> and, uh, so um, thank you so much for um, rounding out the conversation to lead back to the book because uh, this is a very, very helpful Sweet. tone and rich in illustrations of scientific research that um, really backs up uh, so much about the groundedness that you can experience if you register yourself in, in a way that most people, quite frankly, think they're too busy to do so. Mm. So uh, I recommend this book, and it's on sale upstairs, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a number of members here. Congratulations. Well done for being a member of the Rubin Museum of Art, because you get 10% discount on the book tonight. <laughs> so, so take advantage. And um, congratulations, Emma, on doing this. This is really good. good, good, good. And, The way in the Tibetan tradition we like to congratulate is with a katak, which is, of course, the ceremonial scarf that's interwoven with the eight auspicious symbols of the Dharma. And uh, you have trod that path, Emma. So this is, just think of this as another degree, if you like. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so much. Now, the difficulty of giving this to Parker is that she might think, oh gosh, this is yet another thing I'm going to trip over and fall. <laughs> yes. But um, I know you'll wear it very, very elegantly, and it'll keep you warm for the rest of the winter. Thank and uh, we love you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, guys. So please join us again at another Brainwave. We've got quite a few to go right through to the end of April. And uh, as I say, we'll meet you upstairs uh, at the book signing table if you'd want to uh, buy a book of Emma Seppler's. Okay, thank you so much for coming down.